Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25. Sometimes we read big chunks of scripture. Today we're reading just a couple verses. We're going to read this, we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive in. Is that okay? Here we it. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us hold fast, fast without wavering. Are you willing to die for your faith? Are you willing to die for your faith? Without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another. You already heard me say that a little bit this morning. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. I'm not going to look at you. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this incredible word. And um, I pray now that I would be able to articulate this word uh, to our, our church family today as, as best as I possibly can. Um, Fill this room with your Holy Spirit, that your Spirit would open our hearts up to hearing your word in, its, in, the, in the places of our heart where we need to hear your word. Help me to communicate clearly, not a word more, not a word less than what you have for us today, God. Please come and just work in a mighty way, in a powerful way, God. Shape us, mold us, fill us, use us. Bless this time in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you, would, um, that you would come and please work in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, what direction are we going in? That's this, that's this series. What direction are we going in? Uh, if, you, if you got the wrong destination in mind, you know, if, you're, if you're going the wrong way, you're going to get to the wrong destination. So we're, we're spending just a short little series before we enter into our series on prayer uh, coming up here very soon. We're just doing a short little series at the beginning of the year, kind of what's our direction for our church this next year. And last week, we laid out this pretty simple mission, and we unpacked this idea of disconnected to disciple. And I specifically want to just read to you this, this aspect of our mission statement So bring this up, Lyle, if you don't mind. Last week, this is what I essentially unpacked. This is the direction of our church. We want to reach tens of thousands of people who are disconnected from Jesus and his church, who live in this area, and last week I kind of spelled out that area, or our parish or our region. We want to reach those people, connect them to Jesus and his church, right? Make help them in their becoming a disciple or follower of Jesus, and then help them to see that they're an important part of doing that again and again and again, a multiplication of that, so that we are really reaching tens of thousands of people, not because tens of thousands of people come to the dwelling, but because we are discipling people who disciple people who disciple people who disciple people to the fourth spiritual generation. So we actually hear stories. This is what we're hoping will happen. We're actually hearing stories of a kid who disciples their mom I'm just making this up right now. A kid who disciples mom, mom who then disciples neighbor, neighbor who then disciples friend, or something like that. And we're able to actually identify where spiritual, uh, for spiritual generational stuff is happening. Because we really believe that as we begin to move into fourth spiritual generational discipleship, we will begin to actually reach tens of thousands of people in this area, in our region, in our parish, with the good news of Jesus, and actually walk with them in their discipleship relationship. That's what we said is our direction. That's where we're headed. Following Jesus in that process. Now, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? How are we going to join Jesus in what he's... We know Jesus is going to be doing the heavy work. We know this. 
But how are we going to join him in this in terms of reaching people, uh, tens of thousands of people? How are we going to do it? Uh, Because a lot of us are hoping the answer is going to be a committee. That's what we want. We want there to be four or five people who are the sacrificial lambs of the church who come together in a committee and do the evangelism work or something like that, and then we can kind of be rest assured, phew, at least Billy and Mary and Sue, they're going out Saturdays at, you know, 10 o'clock, and they're going and canvassing the neighborhood, and at least hopefully we'll reach people that way. That's not, here's the deal. First of all, I have nothing against canvassing neighborhoods. That's fine if you've been part of that and you do that kind of stuff. That's fine. But one, it's never biblically said that's what you got to go do or something. And two, it's never said that that, um, it's even the most effective way, quite honestly. And I actually don't know if it is. And quite honestly, if I said, hey, let's all get together next Saturday for the next million Saturdays and we're going to go canvass neighborhoods, the three of you that would show up, the three of you that would show up, you'd probably do it for a year or something because you're so passionate about it, and then you'd get sick of it too. Maybe the pastor will do it. Maybe the pastor will do it. That's a good answer, right? It'd be nice if just Seth kind of took care of that side of it. You do the discipleship stuff. You know, we pay David part-time. Why don't you do a little bit of stuff, work with that? And so we have David and Seth doing some of this stuff so that you don't have to take up my Saturdays and I can just kind of be rest assured we're reaching disconnected people. Maybe we need better donuts. I don't know. Galen, I'm not coming after you, but maybe we need better donuts. Uh, Maybe we need to give away more stuff. You know, did you ever see that church over Christmas? A couple, this was a couple years ago. I've already mentioned this, but I saw the church was giving away a car on Christmas. I was like, that's the coolest thing. I want to go to that church. Of course you want to go to the church that's giving away a car. I always say, you, we could have as many, we could have a ton of people here at church on a Sunday morning, by the way. Because if you spend enough money, I really believe you can spend your way to getting crowds. I once paid a guy, I'm not super proud of this, but I'll just say it. And I'm not necessarily advertising this, by the way. But I once paid a guy 20 bucks to come to church. And guess what? He came. He came. And he brought a friend. He literally brought a friend. I paid a guy once 20 bucks to come to church, which was always my proof in the pudding. You can pay your way to crowds. Jesus never says get a bunch of crowds. Jesus never even says get a bunch of people in church on a Sunday morning. Jesus says to make disciples. There's a difference. We could have more people here on on a Sunday morning. If you wanted, if the mission, if the direction was larger crowds, we would be doing things very differently. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to make disciples. So there's a difference. You've got to be paying attention to that. So it's probably not going to be those. Obviously, I'm kind of joking about some of that, although sometimes we wish it was some of those things were the answer to our, our not problem. It is a problem, but our, our mission of reaching tens of thousands of people for Jesus. So what are we going to do? What are some key components of what, of how we get used by God to reach tens of thousands of people. My first point that I want to throw up on the screen is this. Gathering, gathering together is a vital part of making disciples. The coming together of the body of Christ is a vital part of making disciples. Now, when I teach my kids deer hunting, I teach them where the vitals are on a deer so that when they pull the trigger, they're pointing it right at the vitals. I want them hitting the heart or the lungs or something that when that that gets hit by a bullet, am I getting too graphic? I don't know. I hope not. But if I get if it gets hit by a bullet, that animal is going to die really fast. 
Because that's what I would do. So I don't teach my kids, don't aim for the leg. You're not aiming for the hind quarters. You're not aiming for the guts. There's a bunch of a deer you're not aiming at. What you want to be aiming at is the vitals. I'm suggesting the, that gathering together is a vital component of reaching tens of thousands of people and helping them in their discipleship walk with Jesus. Which is why I believe the enemy... For, two thousand, I mean, for thousands of years, has been attacking this idea of the coming together of the saints. Because he knows how vital it really is. This is a vital part of what making disciples really is. Look at this. Let us consider how to stir up, this is from Hebrews, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Holy smoking. Now this is going to get, you're honestly not going to like what I'm about to say. I don't think you're going to like it. Um, but all the more as we see the day approaching. Now, 2,000 years ago, in Acts chapter 2, I want to read to you what they were doing then. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And day by day, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Day by day. And then the author to Hebrews says, all the more as you see the day approaching. Ah, shoot. You know, the whole, the old once a quarter church experience. (laughs) It's a little rough. All the more as we see the day approaching. At what point in the past 2,000 years did the all the more kick in? You know what I'm saying? Like at what point did the all the moreness as we see the day approaching kick in? If day by day they're coming together, day by day, breaking bread, sharing, connecting with each other, and all the more as we see the day approaching. And yet we see as a culture, even a cu- in the culture of the church, a pulling away from gathering. Which I get can have its own, there might be reasons why that is, or it could be challenges, all sorts of different things. But, but we've got to be paying attention to this being a vital component of spiritual formation. And discipleship making. It's vital. And I'm going to explain why in just a second, by the way. If you're waiting for the other shoe to drop and you're like, why, why, why? I'm going to get there. But right now I'm just kind of laying out this idea that right now we're just being told to do it. So, at the dwelling, this is what we talk about. Some of you might say it's not enough. Some of you might say it's way too much. This is what we say. This is part of our vision statement. We talk about gathering together around God's word and prayer and enjoying each other, fellowshipping with each other, caring for each other. We talk about this, doing this on a daily basis in our own homes. We talk about doing this on a weekly basis in God's house. And then we talk about doing this on a twice a month kind of level in a friend's house, a neighbor's house, somebody else's house, being part of relationships with other people. Now, is this, is this a direct connection to dailiness? Well, let's try to unpack this a little bit. Now, again, what I'm about to share isn't to try to make me... I'll, ultimately, what I want to share is simply what we are sensing God is calling us to and how we can best help each other in this process. So like right now, Uh, What does gathering daily look like in my own home? Well, spending time in God's word and prayer on my own. Um, Coming together as a family. You know, just like I asked Johnny and Casey to make that commitment to be raising little Dean in the faith. We 
get our family together on a daily basis each night and we pray and we're in God's word and we have spiritual conversations with each other. Sometimes I don't know the answer, but it's okay. We just engage the spiritual conversations. My wife and I, when our kids are in bed and we've watched our TV or whatever and we're going, getting ready for bed, we spend some time in prayer and in God's word in a difference, kind of just me and her. On a daily basis, gathering together, sharing. And what is that? When, my, when me and my wife are together, the church is there. See? Where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I, Jesus says. You got to go back to my teaching last uh, spring around what is the church. Go look back and look at that sermon series and go let that sink in what I'm talking about here. Because when we say a coming together, well, it's like, oh, golly, do we got to do church every single day? Yes and no. Not the way maybe you're thinking about it, like we got to all be here and get our donut and come in and do that. Maybe not. But a daily coming together? Around God's word and prayer? Maybe. Now, this gets really challenging for somebody who's single. This gets challenging for somebody who's a Christian and is living in a home where there's not another Christian in the home. This can be hard. This could mean you, mom, you, dad, kind of on your own with your little two-year-old, and the church is gathered together in prayer and being in God's word. It could be. It could mean you have to engage with a coworker at work and over lunchtime, you're connecting with that coworker, encouraging each other and walking with each other. Maybe there's, you can argue with me all day long about how it should look or whatever. All I'm trying to say is the author of Hebrews is saying, we've got to be doing this and all the more as we see the day approaching. And we're going to get into the why in just a second. But there's something vital about this. It's not just the big toe that you can shoot that off and you're still going to be okay. This is, the, this is the lungs, the heart, the, I don't know what other things are up in here, but you know, the stuff up in here. Gathering together is vital part of making disciples. First Corinthians, uh, chat, oh, no, let me just quick unpack a couple more of those. Pr- bring that back up, Lyle. The weekly in God's house, we see the coming together, the the church saying, this is a day we're going to come together and we're going to celebrate, we're going to receive from God his stuff and we're going to come together and be together in a kind of larger community. And it doesn't have to just, it doesn't have to be a Sunday. That's what the church has typically said. That's the day. Paul already unpacks this. Pick a day, whatever. Pick some days that you want to find find special and engage those days. That's fine. Whatever it is, maybe it's a Wednesday. Maybe you work Sunday mornings. Maybe it's Wednesday night or something. Whatever. Spend that time in the, maybe it's Saturday. Some of you guys freak out. It's got to be Saturday. Okay, then go do it on Saturday. Whatever. Pick the day. Come together with the church of God. And, and make it a regular rhythm of being together. There's something about that that's been important for thousands of years. Who are we to just say, well, you don't have to do that to be a Christian to go to heaven. Okay, I get what you're kind of thinking. I get that. But man, what are you missing when you make a statement like that? Because at the end of this message, what I'm going to say is you get to do this. God has made a way so that we can be together. This isn't have to so I get saved. This is Jesus on the cross alone by himself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus alone making a way for us to be not alone. To be together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, or no, no, no. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Paul, this is the Apostle Paul saying, Paul says to the church, he says, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are somehow connected to, as we're connected to the head, who's Christ, it connects us to each other in a way that's just incredible. And this was the text I used in the baptism text where 
just a little bit before this very verse in chapter 12, he talks about baptism connecting us as we drink of the same spirit. So our faith in Jesus Christ connects us to each other. Part of the same body. And then we talk about joining together on a bi-weekly basis. This is our more programmatic thing here at The Dwelling. I'll freely admit that. Although it's not meant to be programmatic. The programmatic side is to simply try to get you into a rhythm. That's all the, the, the program side is to get you into a rhythm. But the program side of it is supposed to melt away. As you begin to get to know each other and connect with each other and deepen relationship with each other. So that way, when you get sick, you have people who come around you and bring you a meal or do whatever, do whatever. And they love you and they care for you. Or they don't see you uh, engaging with God's word and prayer. Then Hannah's got to come to Casey and say, hey, I'm not seeing you raising little Dean in the faith. And so I'm going to have to drop the hammer. That's the point. So that we're stirring up and stirring up and we're doing what we're called to do. I haven't even got to the why yet. But I'm starting to tap into it a little bit. So why? Why does gathering together play such an important role? Remember my little water cup illustration last week? Do you remember what I was trying to get across This idea, follow this thought, this idea, now this this is going to come with us for this week and next week, okay? The idea last week that I said is what we're trying to not do is just this, you know, boom, that's it. We're trying to not do that. We're trying to be filled, but then also pour out, right? And so I said, you know, fourth generational kind of thing. Try to lay four levels of generations here is the idea. And I'm not talking age generation. I'm talking spiritual generation. So I get somebody's poured into, and then they pour into somebody, right? And then they pour into somebody, and then they're pouring into somebody. And, and we're, we're engaging God's word and prayer, and we're getting poured into And we're pouring into, just follow me for a second here. And we're crisscrossing and all sorts of stuff is happening, okay? And the idea is we're pouring into and we're pouring out. And God is actually using us and the spirit of God in us to connect with the people around us. Trust me, I sometimes wish Jesus would have done it a different way too. You know, in my mind, it makes more sense to me that Jesus would just be Jesus get a TV talk show or something and just, you know, let people tell people himself directly and just tell people about himself all over the radio waves and we could just kind of go about our life telling people, yeah, go, you know, search this particular YouTube video and you'll get Jesus. That's the way I would have done it. That's not how Jesus did it. Jesus prefers, for some reason, to use you to come to you with his Holy Spirit and work through you to the people around you. And in some way, I'm not going to get into this too much today, but in some way, he's going to actually bless you, even though he does all the work, someday eternally. And the people that you'll come into contact with, even in heaven, Paul says this in Philippians, you are my joy. There's something about that that's just really powerful. I, I, don't, I can't even preach that quite now today. I just don't have time. But... We think of being poured into and then pouring out. Now, why is gathering, why is gathering such an important part of this process? Here's my next point on the screen. There is, follow this thought, please try to stay with me for another just five minutes, ten minutes. There is both a filling, being filled element, as well as a pouring out element to our gathering together. And I'd even say a gathering event. I mean, an actual in time history. This is not floaty. This is actually happening, a gathering together. There is both a being filled element to that as well as, and this is what's going to be maybe new for some of you, also a being poured out element. Let's talk about the first 
first. So as we gather together, we do get filled up, don't we? We get filled up when we gather together. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. That word encourage, here's the Greek word for that. The Greek word is parakaleo, and that word has kind of a, it could mean encourage, it can mean exhort. Um, And so if you back up just a little bit in Hebrews to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, I want you to see this. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort, that word is the same word there. It's used in a different tense, but it's the same word, parakaleo. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you, why? Why would we be doing this? Why is this such a big deal, Seth? That none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So if coming together, it's not enough for you that Jesus says to do it, which should be enough, by the way. But if that's not enough, then here the author of Hebrews says that we would be exhorted and encouraged, which comes through people. I get it. That can be a phone call too. Fine. The person who's working all the angles of how they don't have to be with people. Exhort one another every day as you may be, uh, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is sneaky. Sin is slippery. Sin is so, uh, you don't even see it coming. You don't even know it's there. Paul in Corinthians, he'll actually even say at one point, he'll say, I examine myself and I don't see any problem in me. But even that doesn't kind of say that it's all perfect, that, that everything's okay. It's so sneaky. The deceitfulness and twistedness of sin. And what the author is saying here is the coming togetherness or the phone call, the connecting relationally, there is something about that that is so vital to our faith, not only to our our faith even being sustained. You see how important this is? So that our hearts wouldn't get hardened? Our hearts would stay soft and moldable by the whole, so that the Holy Spirit would just continue to work and grow us in our discipleship walk. One commentary said this, those who despise the church, they capitalized church there. It's not talking about necessarily the dwelling. That's not my po- big point today. Go back to spring, walk, look at my message on the church. Those who despise the church easily fall from the faith. I want to go to Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 40, where this word parakaleo comes up again. This is what Peter says. And with many other, this is Peter now, this isn't Paul, this is the guy Peter, he's preaching here. He says, with many other words he bore witness and continued to parakaleo, exhort, encourage them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And then, look at this. I'm going to read a couple verses here. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to prayer or the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They're caring for each other. 
This doesn't mean you got to go sell your, all your... They're just caring for each other. They're loving each other. If you got nothing and I got a bunch, I'm helping you out. And day by day, amazing to me, they're attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They receive their food with glad and generous hearts. Wow, I love that. They're receiving together with glad and generous hearts. They're praising God and having, watch this, they're having favor with all the people. These are weirdo Christians. Weirdo Christians make me nervous. These are people who actually know their neighbors. They're connected. They got a good rapport. If the guy needs some help, he goes and helps them move the refrigerator or whatever. They're, they become friends. They have favor with the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This book, I, I had our church leadership read this book last year. The Other Half of Church. And the whole premise of this book is that the church, this is his argument, the church has gotten caught up in the enlightenment and rationalism with the idea being that the church sometimes focuses so much on having the right answer at the expense of love and care that it's become problematic. So what he says is there's nothing wrong with having the right answer. The right answer is a good thing. So you want truth. That's not what I'm saying. But he is saying there's another half to the brain, the other half of church. The idea is, but for him is, how important it is to have the right answers, yes. But also to have a community of faith, and he basically has four chapters that he talks about what are essential to the commun these communities of faith. These are his four things. Joy is central. So when a small group gets together, if nobody likes each other, that's going to be a problem. If you don't want to be there because you don't feel like anybody sees you or cares about you, you could be having that problem this morning. Maybe nobody greeted you. Maybe nobody said hi to you. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, it doesn't feel like they even want me here. If that's you today, you're experiencing this problem. Yeah, this is why we say come as you are. This is why we want you to know we, we want you to be here. We want you to be connected. Yeah, but I don't even believe in God. Yeah, we want you here. We'd love to meet you right where you are because we believe that's what God wants to do is meet you where you are. It doesn't mean that we're going to just say things that are not true and we'll just, you know, say, no, we're going to say truth. We're going to say what God's word has to say, but we're still glad you're here. That might tick you off or something, fine, but we're glad you're here. We truly do love you and care for you. This is why his second chapter is love and care. If you're not being cared for in a community, that's going to be a problem. If you don't feel like people care for you, the third thing is, is a community that's absolutely founded on an identity that's rooted in Christ. And his last thing is that healthy correction can happen in the community. So that you can call me out on something and I can call you out on something. We don't have to get so offended by it, but we can just go to God's word and say, hey, Seth, it looks like you're not living according to God's word. And I'm going to actually bring this to your attention in love. See, this is what community is. Community, a biblical idea of community and gathering together is built on joy and care and love and an identity rooted in Christ and a place where healthy correction can take place. I fully buy that. I fully buy that. Day by day, what are they doing? They're gladly receiving. They're caring for each other by selling their possessions. Their identity is absolutely rooted in Christ alone. And they're correcting each other and rebuking each other, which that's all you got to do is read the Bible to see that happens. Paul calls Peter out and says, hey, what you're doing over here in Galatians is wrong. Go read, I think it's Galatians chapter 1 or 2 or something like that, where Paul calls out Peter, the main guy, you'd think. Paul's like, nope, you're doing it wrong. And he does it because the gospel is at stake. So, there is a being filledness to gathering. But, and just give me five minutes, and let me finish here like this. There's also a pouring out piece. 
When we gather together, we do get filled, but we also pour out. And sometimes it's just our presence. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays for us, and I want you to hear what he says. John 17, he says this. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they, he's praying for us right here. He's actually praying for you. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be in us. So he wants us to be so unified, and then why? What is the reason? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Have you ever heard of it like that before? Where you being so unified in, 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 your, in your love and care for other believers, there is something about that that actually bears witness and testimony to those who are disconnected from Jesus. You simply coming together does something. I don't get it fully. There is something that happens. Jesus says this, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. He actually repeats it. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me, so that the world may know. See, some of you want to do this, but you want to do it from a distance. And I'm kind of saying, I don't think that's how it works. We're gonna have, if we're going to be loving and caring for each other, I'm not, see, some of us want to say, I love everybody, and then never be with people. You see, I think that, can be a, that could be a problem. But there's something about our coming together that actually fills us up, yes. But even in our gathering, there's something that's pouring into other people. Uh, look at John chapter, I just got a couple, just John chapter 13. Look at this. John chapter 13, holy smokes, verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. How? If we love one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is unpacking the, the uh, communion. And he unpacks communion in a way that connects, not, you know, the way we do communion sometimes can get disassociated from a lot of times how the early church did it, which was with a meal and sharing in that meal and breaking bread together. And he's unpacking this situation where they're not doing communion right essentially because they're, they're not caring for each other. And what he's basically saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you can go look at this, he's saying... There's something about as we, as we take communion, he says, as we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, there's even proclamation work that takes place as we come together to receive. This is why I kind of wish communion was today. It, we'll do it next week. But I wish it was communion a little bit because as we receive and as we're unified like that, there's a proclamatory thing that's taking place as well. Not only are we being filled but we're also pouring out. Gathering is, is a vital part of helping move people from disconnected to disciples. We gather because Jesus was alone. We gather because we get to do that. We don't have to be alone. He's made a way for us to be connected to not only God, but also to each other. 